Hi everyone. Hello. Welcome to the River Branch and Sky panel. Um, my name is Alex. I am 15 years old and I am a student at the New England Youth Theater where I have been acting and performing for uh, around 10 years. Um, I'm super excited to be here and interview these panelists today. So how it's going to work is we have a list of questions that I'm going to read to you guys and you will answer accordingly. And then at the end, we're going to have 15 minutes of questions from the audience. So uh, if you have any questions, just keep them in your brain till then. Um, so uh, I have here with me Sarah Olmsted Thomas, Alex Vernon, Kathy Erfer, um, Chaba Radley, and, um, and pa Paula Mano. Um, if you guys would just like to introduce yourselves, I'm going to pass the mic along. Hi, I'm Sarah Olmsted Thomas, half of Alex and Olmsted. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Vernon, the other half of Alex and Olmsted. Uh, we're here with our show, uh, Marooned, a space comedy that's at the Latches on Sunday at 4. Kathy Erfer, I'm your river steward for the Connecticut River in Vermont and the director of uh, policy and advocacy for Connecticut River Conservancy for the entire watershed in, in our four watershed states. Uh, Chaba Raduli, uh, I am half of Puzzle Theater, and we are going to play uh, Woods. Um, the rest is coming after. <laughs> Hello, I'm Pavla Mano. From we are coming from Montreal, uh, Montreal-based company Puzzle Theater. I am from Bulgarian origins. He is Hungarian origins, but we are both Montreal company. So, vive les frontières. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, our first question. Um, and you guys can answer in whatever um, order you like. I'll just pass the mic along. All right. What do you think we find when we look at a place, such as a river, a branch, or a sky? And as a follow-up, what responsibilities do we have to the topography that shapes our lives? <laughs> so, such a rich question, and I'm sure we have, we'll have different ways of unpacking it, but I think that as, from the perspective of a puppeteer, I'm often looking at an object and imagining how to, how, how to see it from another perspective, mm -hmm. and how to lend it a voice. Uh, how to imagine it in its own context. What does the river think about me, me diving in or boating through? What does, what does the tree imagine in its own perspective? Uh, there was even one time when we created a short cranky piece called <laughs> Umwelt, which is a concept, uh, a, a biological concept that different species perceive the world differently. And how could we not? Because as humans, we have a certain limited capability in terms of vision and uh, in terms of other aspects of perception, touch and, and smell that is so different from, from other creatures that live and thrive here. And I think an important challenge just as human beings is to try to understand each other <laughs> and engage a little perspective to be able to find peace and harmony and to communicate, but as puppeteers, we need to, we need to do that even more so as we are um, animating objects and trying to lend story to, to aspects of our, our, our world that are often overlooked. Yeah. Um, I think uh, puppetry is, you know, an exercise in empathy. So if you're watching, especially um, a puppet show that has uh, objects instead of human or animal characters, uh, it's really an exercise for yourself, you know, to see an object and say, well, what is that hairbrush feeling right now? You know, or, or oh, what, what is that wooden spoon feeling? And so it's really a look into yourself and, and uh, a chance to empathize further. And so I think when we look at a, a a branch or a stream or a tree, um, and we slow down, 
then you start noticing little stories take place, right? So you see an ant cross the, the, the branch, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is a dramatic moment. Like, mm -hmm. are they going to make it? Oh, there's another ant. Do they know each other? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it just, uh, I think, makes your world bigger and smaller simultaneously mm -hmm. when you can see all the little stories that are happening all around you at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I think the responsibility we have to that topography is um, to, to minimize our own impact on all these little stories and lives that are happening around us that are so easy to overlook. There's a, so much in that question. So, um, you know, when it, the way the question was phrased, it takes me immediately, and you both sort of spoke to this a little bit, you know, the relationship between something objective and subjective and our and how we may respond differently depending on that viewpoint. And I feel like a lot of my work as River Steward is trying to move what we perceive in an objective way to per being able to perceive it in a subjective way so we are in relationship with it. And like you guys so eloquently described, right, we are living with it and responding to it and feeling it. Um, and, you know, as the river and our ecosystems recover, I feel like it's really been this divide of objectifying our topography, yeah. right, um, that has damaged it. And so, like, the pathway back is finding that subjective relationship with it. And interestingly, I don't think it's like in our consciousness really to do that. And it comes up in ways, and I'll tell two quick stories. One, I was raised in southern Arizona in an area that was flat in the desert where it was actually surrounded by mountains. And it wasn't until I think I was in my 40s and missing that place, I realized that the mountains were like a hug right, that that valley felt safe because the mountains were kind of holding it like a bowl. Um, and there was another story like that that just completely flew out of my brain, so maybe I'll come back in a second. But, I, I, you know, literally, oh, no, that's what it is. So the topography, you know, it took me a, t a while to reflect on that and feel that and notice that. And in our work, we do a lot of dam removals, and this comes up, there's a lot of um, visceral response of uh, skepticism and worry and anger about the changing of that space wherever we may be doing a, a dam removal. And we found it's like there really is an emotional journey of a community with even those individual dams to be able to accept and like kind of emotionally work through the change of that and trust that there will be something bountiful and beautiful as a result of that action. So, <laughs> well, I started with puppetry at the age of nine, so I kind of see everywhere just puppets. Uh, and um, just a short story about uh, how we did our first uh, puppet show together, which is called Plastic. It's because we were in our park uh, in Montreal with our <laughs> child, who was then uh, two, three years old, and it was full of plastic bags everywhere. Like, they were on the trees, around, they're on the garbages. And I was watching these plastic bags, and I said, so much plastic bags, so much waste. Let's take them and make some show out of it. <laughs> and by joke, but really by joke, we said, okay, yeah, it will be a cheap show. I mean, it won't, it, it won't, it won't cost much. <laughs> so let's try to do something with all these plastic bags. It won't be waste. So, and we end up with a show that it's called Plastic and that we are playing already 14 years and that we made 450 shows already. Uh, this is just a short story about plastic. And then there is another short story about a tissue box. Uh, we are at the table and our child doesn't want to eat. So his father takes a tissue and starts making some funny stories with a tissue. And the child is washing the tissue, and so I put a lot of food in his mouth. <laughs> and, then, 
And then the father says, hmm, this will be a good show. Just a well, box of napkins. We can travel, cabin luggage. So this is how we started. We made a show called Disposable. And it's a show for adults. And it's just one box of napkins. And then we're walking in the forest. And we see some branches. And I see uh, this thing. And I say, oh, well, this thing, uh, maybe it can become a puppet. Yeah, what do you say? And if we put two more, what will be from this one? So I just collect some puppet branches and I give him and he starts moving it. And I say, oh, this is a nice puppet. OK, <laughs> let's do a show with, uh, with branches. And um, it's kind of, uh, how to say, we, we always start from the um, ludique in English, from the, um, from the funny side of it, like from, from the playing side of it. Oh, let's play with this thing and let's, let's do, let's see what we can do with. And, and once we start working around and digging in, and then, then we reach to, to how we shape our environment. Like we, we kind of start from the environment that shapes us. And after we, after at the end of the process, we reach to the, how we shape our environment. So this is kind of our way of working. Uh, we never have a script. We start from, from the things around to find their story, to find their way of thinking and what they have to tell us. And then at the end, people who see the show, they have their own story. We try to not give too much messages, but you, you cannot avoid, everyone has its, its own message. You have something to add? Oh, like this, it's very easy. <laughs> uh, what, else, what to add? Well, when I heard these questions, I said, well, when, when, I, when I'm just watching out from my head, I used to get lost in between uh, thoughts and colors and rhythms and, and the wonder of, of all this that surrounds me. Uh, I cannot really make a thought out of all these things. <laughs> um, uh, then um, uh, responsibility, about the responsibility. Mm, well, both. I th yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I think um, what Alex said, it, it's kind of close to what, what I know him um, feels like. Always see some little bugs doing some things. Come, come, come to see this one. Uh, look where he's going, what he's doing. And being very careful, what, exactly what you said, to, to being very careful to not disturb these small stories that are happening there. I think it, it, you, you really sentence it very well. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and I will share you sharing right now about the, the being surrounded by all of this stimulation of things of beauty that, that spark feelings in you and spark wonder. That's also what we are trying to do from your perspective, Kathy, as a scientist and trying to engage with your commu the community to, to recognize the wonders of this river that are so, so vast and complex. And as we are also trying to catch light, capture lightning in a bottle with uh, just the wonder of play and um, animating something that we were objectifying and it becomes subjective, it becomes full of feeling and emotion. And that, that is also, I think, an important exercise for the brain, <laughs> um, not only to experience delight, but also to, uh, to, to spark wonder. Thank you guys so much. That was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> All right, the next question. In what way does Earth influence the way we live? In what ways do we influence the Earth? <laughs> I mean, I am a creature of this Earth. I am an animal. <laughs> all, t all terrestrial life on Earth emerged from the top six inches of soil. We, we are not so different from the trees or the bugs. I think for me, the older I get, the more I marvel at 
how I am a bug. <laughs> and I'm just here for a short amount of time, and it's just kind of a marvel to be alive at all. So <laughs> that's my own that's my own perspective, but I, I just feel I'm amazed by also time because our planet has been around for so long and I am here for such a short time. Uh, for, for me, the, when I think about the earth and um, uh, I, I'm just full of wonder and feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so interesting. When you first asked it, uh, you know, how does the earth influence uh, my work? It's like, oh yeah, our earth, that's the place I live. Like, that's my connection with it, the planet earth. Um, but then it's, you know, it's increasingly more difficult to, to feel that connection all the time because we're, we create so many um, places for us to exist inside buildings and, and uh, away from maybe more of the natural world or more just in a digital space where it's, it's really remarkable when you go out for a walk and you do turn on that sort of bigger awareness and you're like, oh yeah, this is this is my backyard. This was here the whole time. There's an incredible natural world that's existing that I'm existing in, um, and uh, I think it's really special to to allow yourself the space and focus to shift on over and and be more aware of that natural world again. This is a little unwieldy. <laughs> Uh, I think that we, uh, the short answer is like, I feel like it's a dance, right? There's a constant, like we are in constant relationship with the earth and the earth with us. And, and I think for the humans with our big brain, the, you know, part of the failing is that we forget that or we don't know that or, and we, we don't hold that viscerally. But so two things came to mind maybe apropos of nothing but related. Uh, one of the things that struck me, I got my master's degree at Antioch and we, we spent a whole, I don't even know what class this is, but it was a you know sort of description of the earth spinning around the sun and the gravitational pull on the earth and the weather and how it, you know, how it flow, the, clo the clouds flow around the earth. When I, when I finally was able to kind of like put all of this together in my head, like all of those things that we sort of look at separately, what I realized is the earth is pulsing and breathing, right? And so in its spinning, it is actually, you know, it gets a little squeezed at the poles and then it expands. And, you know, I, I, I wish I could animate, you know, the what it looks like in my head when you start to really l put all of those cycles of things together, but really it's like, it's it's not this flat, round ball, right? It is a pulsating, alive sphere. Uh, and that was, uh, it was pretty profound, I think, for me to, to realize that, to really sort of remove our, you know, my frame on the earth from this kind of static globe to a pulsing living creature almost, right? Mm -hmm. That simultaneously has fire within it that is like moving plates on it that is, you know, creating new ground. And so um, just sharing that because, you know, it, it made it visceral to me, right? Like that the earth is actually alive, like it's actually alive. Um, the other random thought that came to mind is now that we have, you know, our science has progressed and we are delving into genetics and understanding genetics, one of the things, you know, we've categorized the plants and the animals and the humans in this sort of, you know, superstructure so that we can kind of put everything in categories. But one of the things they found in the genetics is that mushrooms are actually more closely genetically related to humans than they are to plants. Mm -hmm. And so that also, I, I think those discoveries have been fun for reframing, you know, what we think about our relationship with all the other living things and realizing like, oh, in fact, you know, those mushrooms may be a very close cousin and who knows how <laughs> we relate to them, right? Um, we have a small garden and uh, when I have a little time, <clears throat> I like 
not so much working in the garden, mostly collecting the fruits and and all what gives. <laughs> this this part is really fun. Um, and uh, all the time, for example, this summer, all the time I had this this thought that, okay, wherever I I, I just put my hand, it gives me something. Gives me some, it gives me something all the time. And uh, well, it's not. Um, um, so it, it it's it's kind of a subjective picture that I'm trying to describe. Um, that I feel when I have the chance to 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 to, to be away from city, I feel this 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 constant giving, 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 and. Uh, Actually, the cities, in the cities, we are completely cut from this. And then, uh, and then I would go out to, to receive something, but uh, there is not much, I mean. Um, and um, I think it's very subjective. It, it's not even very clever, what I'm saying. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's it. anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, but I think this situation that we found ourselves, it shapes us. And I think being living in these in these uh, huge structures that we call cities, we we don't receive. We don't receive every day. Mm. We did, it, it it just shocks me. It shocks me how much I'm receiving, but, but berries, but leaves, but air, but, but beauty, but, but fun, but I, I don't know you, but I I'm, I'm keep laughing when I'm alone in the, uh, somewhere. Um. <laughs> 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 and, and, um, and, and this shaped our ancestors, and now our cities are shaping us. Uh, well, um, as uh, Katie said, they're just discovering more and more things and more and more things uh, and more and more things about nature and about how the tree they communicate, the trees they communicate and they give to each other some signals if there is a danger so the others they prepare and all these things. And I, I feel like more we know, less we know. And we take for granted some things that are such a miracle that if you start thinking about how this evolved till there and how complex it's all what is happening just one plant to grow or just I don't know one bird to fly or to sing or and uh, I I feel smaller and smaller and smaller and I always have this picture often have this picture of I don't know if you saw it there is a zoom out of the earth so there is, let's say, the city you live, and zoom out, and the continent, and zoom out, and the earth, and then zoom out, and, and the solar, um, and then zoom out, and the Milky Way, and then zoom out, and then zoom out, and continues to zoom out, and zoom out, and zoom out for, for millions of, of light years, and there is still things that exist, and we are so a little dust of it, I often have this image, well, we are just a little dust of it, and, and what we are breaking our heads with stupidities, it just enjoy it, take <laughs> it, enjoy it, take it, and that's it, be it. Like, this is what, what I feel about being part of this earth and this life of this universe of this. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. All right, the next question. How do stories of life come from things that aren't necessarily alive? None of these questions will be easy. They will not be getting easier. I didn't understand the beginning of the question. How do stories of... How do stories of life... Come from things that aren't necessarily alive? Um, sort of how... 
do we create life and feeling from things that don't move or breathe or um, things that we perceive as not being alive, just like objects? <laughs> I, I, you know, our stories of life are actually also our stories of death, right? So there really is no divide. Mm -hmm. um, but the couple of things that came to mind mm -hmm. were uh, viruses. You know, viruses are not perceived as living. And yet. And yet, they profoundly affect our life, right? So, um, I don't know, that's the one thing that came to mind. The other is, uh, I was thinking of the... Um, I was thinking of rocks m making a nest and the relationship between uh, fish and how they spawn um, and using inanimate objects for something that protects life. Uh, Do you want to go first this time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can go first. Uh, <laughs> what comes first in mind, it's, uh, from puppetry perspective, it's the play. You play. Mm. You, you just play. And the life comes on like it's it just is that simple. Uh, you spend hours and hours and hours of just playing, and and the story comes, and the story appears, the characters appear. Then it's the play. I um, I think it's for me. It's that simple. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think a lot about. Um, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, pareidolia, pareidolia, which is like the, um, the, the phenomenon of, of seeing faces in inanimate objects, uh, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So like just with the, the sticks that y you found, it's like you, you, you pass by a tree and you see a, a, a few knots and you're like, oh, that looked like a face for a second. Or you see shadows in a bushes and it looks like an animal for a second. Uh, and it comes from way, way back in sort of our early brain, uh, and it's a, a, an evolutionary benefit because uh, if you can identify a potential threat in the bushes, in the shadows, in the trees, faster than uh, an early human who can't, then you're gonna be able to avoid that threat. So we evolved with that part in our brain that we don't really have a use for anymore now, but still exists. And so to be able to create stories from, uh, create stories of life from objects that don't have life, tap into a part of our brain that we don't get to exercise very often. Um, and when it stimulates that part of the brain, uh, I don't know, it stimulates a more creative um, early brain aspect of yourself that you don't get to work out that often. I think that's really special. Well, I don't know if I have much more to contribute other than I just love what you shared about play, Pavla. And I think that's so prevalent in our work as artists and also in your work as a scientist. I mean, the imagination needs to be engaged in order to come up with new connections. Or if you have, you imagine, oh, well, what if perhaps this species is able to achieve this this interesting behavior because, right, and then you're like, you're engaging play and engaging the imagination. And mm. I think that that is, uh, I think we are all, we all have this ability. And as citizen scientists, citizen artists, we, we need all of the opportunities we can get to open the mind, open the heart, and imagine something new. And I think what we're all engaged in is we're engaged in the process of inspiring new thought. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I really love what you said about play in regards to nature and like so many people's, I think, relationship with nature at this point is, is one of recreation. So if if you go out for a hike, if you go out kayaking, that's sort of, if you're going out into nature, it's for pleasure reasons instead of maybe farming reasons or, or um, ecology reasons for, I think, the majority of the population. And so to be able to 
have a relationship with nature that is primarily based in play then makes you more empathetic towards sides of it that need conservation or need saving. Well, I think here with uh, the, the, the imagination is the uh, is what 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 yeah it's my key word. Um, it, for me, imagination it's uh, it's it's a wonder, it's a mystery. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a, such a such a tool that. Um, um, that 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 opens. Um, okay. Um, I think I lost my, the. I think I lost the the line of my talks. Okay. Yeah. You were in your imagination. Yeah, I was in my imagination. <laughs> Play and nature. And yeah. I can, well, I think I think I might build on your imagination opens because two other things. So when you were describing that back of the head very viscerally, <laughs> I was like, oh, that feels so good. And it occurred to me that that accessing that space may actually heal us. Like it may actually like support our immune system, right? <laughs> and like kind of um, heal us. And specifically. I had a very difficult morning. I had 15 minutes this, on my way here, and I went to the river just to like stick my feet in and like sit in the sun for a couple minutes. And I was noticing the lack of fishes, uh, which is something a river steward notices. And as I had my feet, this big fish came over and started to swim around my feet, and I and I. I thought for a second, it must not know it, I'm here. And then I thought, no, I think it might know I'm here. And then I thought, maybe it came here on purpose because it could perceive I was feeling upset. And that is like that, it's the moment of imagination when you can start to engage in a way that then completely shifts your existence, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like that little fish gave me a little blessing that immediately made me feel better, even though I was making up the story about maybe why it ended up by my feet. Um, and so, you know, that, it, that 15 minutes healed me at the river, just being able to have that little bit of time to like reflect um, and be in relationship with things. And so anyway, that's where your thought took me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, so we had a Zoom call in order to prepare for this panel. And Kathy, you shared a really beautiful story um, about a fish called the lamprey mm -hmm. that are in um, our rivers. And I found it to be really fascinating. And then there was some like reflection from you guys on it. And I thought just that was a really awesome conversation so I thought maybe if you would like to share that story and if you guys would like to reflect some more on it. <laughs> sure and I was thinking could I borrow your stick? The yeah. first stick, yeah. the little head. I was like oh my god it looks just kind of like a lamprey. It looks like a little bit of a lamprey with a hat on mm -hmm. but with the face sort of like this and this round bit. Um, so we, would you like to? Hold the lamprey. Um, so we, um, you know, as the river steward and uh, our organization works on trying to support the migratory fish in the Connecticut River. And so there are some, there are, there are resident fish that are our neighbors that are here all the time, like the trout, right? Like uh, literally our neighbors. And then we have the visitors from the big cities that come up, you know, the ocean travelers, the sophisticated fish, whatever, however you want to frame them. They come up the river. Um, to migrate and spawn. We have one resident fish that is a big adventure and goes out to the ocean to spawn. That's the American eel. So the American eel likes to go the other way. They leave their babies in the ocean to find their way home. But sea lamprey, short-nosed sturgeon, uh, American shad, and herring, 
in the lower part of the watershed are coming into the river to spawn. And they do a magnificent and amazing <laughs> transformational process moving from salt water into fresh water and they live, right? Which in itself is astounding. But at any rate, the sea lamprey. <laughs> Uh, the sea lamprey in the ocean is parasitic, and it sucks on, you can use me as an example, it sucks on fishes and, uh, you know, lives on them. <laughs> when they get big enough and they decide that they would like to spawn, they let go, and they come, <laughs> they come up the rivers all around the Atlantic seaboard. So there's sea lamprey that are on the Atlantic side. There's also Pacific Ocean sea lamprey. They come up the rivers... And when they come up the river, they have stopped eating, they begin to go blind, and they are making their last trip in order to reproduce. And so in our area, they literally come up into like the West River, into our local streams. They find uh, an area that would be like about three feet deep. They need to have cobbly rocks that are kind of fish, fist, fist sized, um, and they and a bigger one. And so they will literally take their little sucker mouth and they will turn the stones over in a circle and build a nest. And they'll do this around a big stone in the middle. At the downstream end, they'll make a little dam, so it'll be a little taller, um, so that when the water's slowing downstream, there's a little bit of an eddy. Then the male and the female sea lamprey hold onto the rock, do their thing. <laughs> and the amacetes hit the deck, right? They like their instinct is to swim down, they burrow into the sediment, and then they stay there and grow and they feed on the detritus of the river as it like breaks down in the sediment. The adults die on the nest and the nutrients that they have brought up from the ocean then feed our um riverine freshwater species. The babies live in the sediment for up to about seven years, and then and they slowly grow. And sometimes, if you're fishing, you'll catch a fish, and there'll be a little hitchhiker on it that'll be about this long, maybe suckered onto the fish. It's not eating. It's literally hitchhiking to get back out. And so those um, juvenile sea lamprey will start to migrate out uh, and then, you know, get out to the ocean and then spend their adult life until they're ready to reproduce and they come back up. Mm. Wow. So, so two additional little thoughts here. One, on the 23rd, for anyone that's local, we're actually saving some sea lamprey that are going to be stranded in the, uh, the Turner's Falls Canal is being drained. And we bring volunteers out to try to save some of those sea lamprey. Um, so you can find that on our website. That aside, the other really interesting thing about Vermont is the sea lamprey. There are also sea lamprey that have been landlocked in Lake Champlain. And those sea lamprey are treated as invasive and nuisance species. They use lamprecide to try to kill them because they are suckering on the native fish uh, in the lake and impacting the, that fishery. And so in the state of Vermont, we have like what essentially is kind of like a, a fish that's having sort of a schizophrenic relationship with our communities, right? Mm -hmm. So literally, on the western side of the Green Mountains, we are trying to eradicate the species. Mm -hmm. And on the eastern side of the Green Mountains, we are welcoming it and hoping we have more of them mm -hmm. and you know, sort of celebrating its successful migration from the sea. So. Um, that's the story I told, and it's a very <laughs> interesting and challenging like messaging thing in Vermont in particular to help people kind of understand the details of this particular fish. If we have people that are on, on this side of the state, if they catch one, they'll kill it um, when, you know, they're trying to just reproduce. So. Sarah, that, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I was thinking, this is where context is so critical. And I think a responsibility we have as a human species that wields such power is to be informed in a more thorough way. The sea lamprey in the Connecticut River needs to be protected and spared. The sea lamprey 
in the lake needs to, needs to be eaten. <laughs> but, and, but to recognize that it's not just, oh, this one fish is this, has this one identity, this one label. We behave, we re respond to it this way, that it contains multitudes. <laughs> and uh, to recognize that there is a complexity even in, our, um, in how we categorize, I should say, understand uh, other creatures in our relationship to them. And uh, this is a very difficult thing. I think we can see politically. It's like, oh, one or the other, right? It's very binary, but the re reality is, is that um, we have to um, we have to open the mind to to see where where something can be more than one thing. Uh, uh, this is a, an important exercise. Yeah, I, I remember in, uh, in our Zoom when when she told the story. I said, oh, this can be our next show. <laughs> it's uh, it's amazing as a story. But then we were speaking about the context. You remember, I, I found this very interesting how the context um, uh, shapes, the, um, shapes everything. Like depending on the context, this fish, it's good or not good, or depending on the context. Uh, I don't know why my English is not so, my, my thoughts are coming in French, so I'm trying to translate and it's <laughs> a bit complicated. But um, yeah, I, I wanted to bring back the, um, the idea about the context and how it depends in, in repeating again context that we are, um, it's the message we give. Uh, so I think it's very important to, to have this conscience about all the little details and all the multitude of, as Sarah said, uh, complexity of, of lives and situation and not to simplify. Mm -hmm. It's the same when you do a show or you do a movie or you write a book, to not simplify, to not, to not make uh, one, one um, flat story or one, uh, one point of view, but to let a lot of uh, underground waters and a lot of underground life that to nourish the, the audience, that they to imagine things themselves and to imagine stories themselves around, uh, around what you show. This is from puppetry perspe perspective. <laughs> Context is story. All right, so now we're going to move to our question portion. Thank you guys so much. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and I will run the mic over to you and then I will run it back to the panelists. <laughs> I just wanted to um, say the lamprey story though, isn't it because the St. Lawrence River, like the, the rivers are supposed to be flowing in and out without dams to the ocean. But the, the, I thought the sea lamprey were villainized in the Great Lakes because of that St. Lawrence River that they built. And we're not supposed to build that. We're not supposed to dredge those rivers so deeply that then the, 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 the lamprey went into these river, these lakes that then they can't get out of. So anyway, I just feel like, wait, you told that story, but without the part of the human intervention is what made them evil vampire lampreys that people want to kill is because of the human intervention on the landscape and on the land. And if it would had been kept... But if the humans didn't put that, that um, dredge that, that channel between the ocean to the Great Lakes, then we would be in fine balance. I just feel like you, you left out that story. I'm like, wait, that's a part of the story. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, as soon as you said context, I was thinking, we created the context for that story. So yeah, you're totally right on. And I think it, like, it's, it really, it, there's always this question of frame. I mean, you think of it even from the perspective of watersheds, right? Like, I can think in the scale of the Connecticut River watershed, and then I can think in the scale of the West River watershed as a piece of that. And so... Uh, yeah, there's always this question of like frame and context and how many steps back you take in the, f the frame of what you're looking at. But yes, totally, that fish is there because of we made it possible, yeah. Yeah, and I think that story is reflected into all sorts of human stories too of like, okay, well, 
how many generations ago did did um, uh, one country uh, put another country in a difficult position? And now here we are, where it's really easy to say, like, oh yeah, this country's the bad guy, without looking back and saying, well, it's sort of our fault that they're in a desperate situation. Um, so it's all all that context, mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, um, uh, thank you for these wonderful complex questions and all your great answers. It's really got me thinking a lot about um, a sense of place and how that comes into the context of how we engage with nature and the world around us and the stories we choose to tell as performing artists. Um, and I guess I'm kind of curious about that for all of you how that has influenced you. What is your sense of place? Um, as, as a point of context where I'm coming from, I grew up here in Brattleboro, but I moved away uh, 25 years ago, and I now live in a very different environment of, of uh, Northwest Iceland. And I know that in my own artistic practices has shifted dramatically how I interact with the world around me and what, I, what stories I perceive to be um, things that, with voices that I want to elevate. Um, some of those go back to using object and memory, you know, and using this as a, a sensory exploration of my life here in this part of the world. And some of that is an exploration of living somewhere where I've never felt like the world wanted to kill you quite so much as, as living up on the Arctic Circle, where it's quite, quite clear that human influence is not welcome from an from a, <laughs> from a environmental perspective. Um, so I'm kind of curious if this sense of place is something that you all experience with your different locations. Um, you know, you guys have grown up in different contexts and are now working in Montreal. You've both were immigrants and moved into a place. And does that feed into your work? I, you guys are New York based, is that correct? Uh, Baltimore. Baltimore. Oh, well. So I just wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, this is um, this is a big question, because uh, when 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 you grew up somewhere, of course, all the environment you, you bring this world with you, and then you are in another place where everything can be very different. Uh, if how much it, this all this reflects in the work, well, uh, much less than 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 the person would like. Uh, actually appears that, well well the, the the seeing the world a little bit differently than the others a little bit but just a little bit yes it, it exists but uh, but uh, this doesn't mean that it's better or worse but it's just a little bit different um, usually at least in our case work chooses its direction and brings us how much we are influencing it, uh, I don't know. Um, 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 um. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure, I was uh, grown in a communist country when, where we were doing the things to do the things and not to be paid. So this is, I, it's, I am like imprégné, um, like it's, it's wired. part of, I'm wired in this way that uh, I do the things they to become good and not to be paid. And I think this pays, pays back with the result of the work because when you are not looking for, for uh, you're not counting your hours because you're paid per hour to do this job, but you are doing it till it's, you are satisfied, until you think it's good. I think this is really um, something good, what I got from the communism. Uh, the other very good thing that I got from the communism, and I'm very thankful, is that we had nothing, but nothing. And uh, if you wanted something, you had to make it. And you had to, like let's say my father was making all the furniture at home, he was an actor but he was making the furniture at home because what you could buy, it wasn't really like, eh. And uh, you should, if you want a shelf that you want to look like how you want to look, you have to do it. 
You cannot buy it. And then you, you are wired in a way, okay, I need this, how I can do it? And you are not wired in a way, okay, I need this where I can buy it. And I think this as well, uh, it shapes our work a lot because my imagination just goes in the way, okay, how I can do it and not from where I can buy it. And this brings me to invent some ways and some ways of making things or inventing even some objects or some ways of doing something that didn't exist before. I'm not aware about, but after I realized that actually this, I invented it, didn't exist before. Yeah. So for sure, this uh, was living for 18 years in the communism. I was born and grown in. So I think this is definitely shaping my work. And that's why we are kind of, um, our shows are, they enter in, they have to enter in the trunk of the Toyota <laughs> they have to enter in one suitcase and be arranged on the top of our bed in our living room, bedroom, <laughs> or something. I mean, it's, uh, it shapes you. You cannot, it, you cannot escape, for sure. I would add to this one when you said that. Uh, when you said that, um, uh, when when you wait. When you need something, you have to no, invent No, no, before you were saying. No. Okay, uh, I miss it. Um, well, you can, don't count your hours. Yes, don't yeah. count your, uh, yes. Yeah. I would add to this one that the fact that, uh, that we weren't grown in, in, in Western Europe or in North America, it is true that uh, when, we create, when we create something, we are not, we are trying, well, the time is changing, we are changing, but we are, keep trying not to make it to be easily sellable. Mm -hmm. Like we don't want to, to create something that, that you can sell because this means what? This means that you show to the people something that they already know, that, that, uh, that, that fits into, the, into a, a distributing system, uh, which is okay. A lot of people are doing it very well, but it just doesn't fit with us. And um, so this is another thing I think that we that we bring with us. But there are million anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so grateful for, the, for what you just said. Yeah. Thank God. Um, uh, the thought that in response to your question, one of the things that came to mind for me was I remember my first job working for a river organization was in northern New Jersey for Hackensack Riverkeeper. And during my um, time there, that was the beginning of when I, I reoriented from um, kind of living on the land via roads to living on the land via rivers. And it was a very clear, like, I, it was a very clear shifting of frame. I mean, I can still navigate roads. But, you know, like, what it made me realize is, like, I, um, and w once you see something, right, you, you can't go back. So I move through space kind of constantly aware of the topography of the landscape, right? And where is the low part? And where would the wet wetland be? And where is there a river crossing, you know, or... Um, and it's, you know, on one level, I'm very, like, I'm very grateful that I have that view, but because that's my work, it's, it's also can be overwhelming, right? To like not be able to not see that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there's, there's literally times when I, you know, my partners from Syracuse will drive west, we go over the green mountains and I leave the watershed mm -hmm. and there's part of me that's like, oh, thank you. Like I don't need to pay attention to the shape of the land here. You know, I can sort of like go a little bit of that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, can you restate the question? Absolutely not. I have no idea what that's anymore. Oh. <laughs> um, a sense of place. Like, how does a sense of place yes. um, feed into your artistic expression? Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. I, just, I loved hearing all the answers so much. Um, the sense of place, I, I feel like um, 
the biggest thing we want to do with our work is create a reason for, for people to come out together as a community and experience something. And I think that's something that this festival does really, really well. And, and they really approached it with the mindset of, of community engagement and community building and, and people having space to come together and, and experience something. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, getting people out of their individual experiences of life in the world and experiencing something together in itself is, is a, a wonderful thing. Um, and then if you can infuse that experience with, uh, with humor so that um, people are laughing together and breathing together and, and having this shared experience, even if it's something absurd, it's like, oh my God, I wasn't experiencing that. Like, what, what a joy to be surprised. Um, and to use their imagination and use their empathy together uh, to see an object or uh, an animal or a creature um, in a way that they identify with also helps exercise that empathy so that when they go out into the world, even if they're not conscious of it, they're, they're looking at people who they pass on the street a little differently instead of, um, you know, oh, that car wants to cut me off. It's like, no, traffic needs to zipper, right? Yeah. And that's like all what life is. <laughs> it's like, okay, I can slow down and let that person in. It's, it's okay if there's one car ahead of me. We all are trying to get to the same place. I don't know if I have much more to add. I really love what Alex just shared about creating a place with our work for people to inhabit. Deborah Hunt, who's also performing at the festival, shared once that our, our responsibility as artists is to build new worlds. And I think about that often. As we create a show, we create a world. And in that world, <clears throat> there's a logic. And there's a reality. It may be reflective of our own. It may be different. And we have to open our minds in this world. And I, I think I may be losing my train of thought here. <laughs> but. Um, Yeah, I see, I see in so much of what we do is creating, creating a place mm -hmm. for us all to gather and ha feel and experience mm -hmm. something communally and uh, rem uh, remind us all. I think it's very easy as, as humans to feel isolated mm -hmm. in our own thoughts, in our own experiences, feel alone, and then the reminder of, uh, you're not alone. <laughs> You're going, you, what your, your sadness is universal. It's the oldest story. <laughs> Let's laugh about it. Let's cry about it. And um, uh, I think holding space for how, how serious things are and also being able to laugh about it all. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. But um, thank you guys so much. That was incredible. Um, and do I? <laughs> Thank you all so much, if you'll forgive my intrusion. Um, in lieu of an introduction, I would like to offer an epilogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you to our youth facilitator, Alex, for being here today. As well as our panelists, and of course, our audiences both in person and online. Uh, this was Access to the Arts, our second panel, Rocks, Trees, and water to discuss our relationship with the natural world. Uh, I welcome you all and also thank you for being here. The 12th iteration of Puppets in the Green Mountains, just around the bend. Uh, these conversations are so important to make 
uh, connections, both artistic and communal, between the community that come to see us, the community that are part of our panel, our visiting artists, and everyone in between. So thank you so much for being here. I also want to thank HowlRound and FACT TV for not only streaming and archiving, but providing closed captioning for today's panel. Uh, if you would like to see these festival shows and see our wonderful artists, uh, Bois Woods is showing Sunday at Hilltop Montessori School at 11 a.m. and again at 2 p.m. And of course, Alex and Umstead will be performing Marooned, a space comedy, this Sunday at 4 p.m. at the Latches Theater. I encourage you all to join us. I would like to thank our festival funders, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Clues Fund, the Wolf Kahn Foundation, and of course the New England Foundation for the Arts. Without their support, this festival would not be possible, as well as the support of our sponsors and of course people like you for donating to the festival. Uh, I would invite you to join us tomorrow, same time, same place, for our third and final panel of this series. Uh, illuminating Converging Pathways. It will be addressing the relationships between art and community engagement with Deborah Hunt of Mask Hunt Motions, the Farrell Ensemble, and filmmaker Willow O'Farrell. We hope you will join us for these wonderful conversations. Thank you again. Thank you.